Looks like we're packing them in this morning. Everybody's away for 4th of July, huh? All right, well, we have, um, we have finished up a couple of things. Uh, we finished up the whole marriage thing last week. Um, so I'm kind of uh, going to be a little selfish, maybe, and um, use this study here in Corinthians because I'm working on a project that I need to research Corinthians for, and so it's as good as any to, to turn that into a study. Uh, Corinthians really is actually a very fascinating book in the Bible. Out of all of the congregations in the New Testament that Paul started in Corinth was by far and away the most trouble. They had, they had one thing after another going on in Corinth. They, they were a divided congregation. Uh, you know, we here were stronger than they were in Corinth, and they had St. Paul as a pastor. Uh, one trouble after another that, that was just gross, horrible things going on. So they're, they're a good congregation to study for today's world because a lot of the things that were going on in Corinth are problems typical today. So you see on the map there, in the handout, a little bit about where Corinth was. It's, uh, it's like right at the base of this isthmus in, in Greece, bottom of Greece. And it was easier for ships, as you can see on the map, instead of going all the way around the southern point, to cut through that little channel there. And uh, the smaller boats, they actually used to drag them across that isthmus. There was a special uh, trail for these boats. They'd put them on carts and pull them over. And it saved a tremendous amount of time. Uh, so consequently, Corinth became a very important seaport. Uh, which we'll talk about in a bit. So the, uh, the comments underneath the maps. One, founded by the Dorians around 800 B.C. Why that's significant is because the Dorians also founded places like Athens and Sparta. Uh, the Dorians are credited by a lot of scholars with bringing homosexuality and making it common practice in Sparta and Athens and, and Greece. So the fact that Corinth was started by that culture that's foundational for the beginning of homosexuality is not an accident. What Corinth was was a very good reflection of who the Dorians were. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was everywhere. In fact, the Greeks and the Spartans particularly, uh, the, the homosexual thing was actually seen as a tool, uh, especially for soldiers. Uh, it's said that the Spartans, Spartan soldiers, who were the best fighters in the world uh, at the time, probably the best hand-to-hand -hand combat people the world has ever seen, that they were required to uh, have intercourse with each other, the soldiers, under the belief that somehow or another it would make them fight better for each other on the battlefield. And the Greeks had actually a whole uh, uh, platoon of soldiers that were homosexual with the same mentality. It would help them fight together. And they were known as an extremely good fighting force, evidently. So this... Um, the, the Dorians founding Corinth is significant in terms of establishing a moral character of what it was built on. Uh, it was a Greek port city with two ports. It had one on each side of this isthmus. Uh, Corinth was very wealthy then due to its location. With two seaports coming in, they had trade going both ways. And they were, they were growing rich because of it. It was the center for the worship of the goddess Aphrodite. Uh, which is said to employ at one time a thousand temple prostitutes. Uh, there are three temples to Aphrodite that have been found in Corinth. Uh, due to this, sexual tourism was a sizable industry in Corinth. There are still 
Uh, there are still comments found in ancient Greek writings about people sailing to Corinth to lose all of their money on prostitutes. Uh, there's an Olympic champion. They have an inscription from him that after his victory in the Olympic Games to honor the god Aphrodite, who he credited with his victory, he was going to donate a, a hundred new prostitutes to the temple there. So that whole sexual tourism thing was huge. Corinth was a center for prostitution. Uh, the term Corinthia zamai, uh, which is Greek for I act like a Corinthian, was used by Aristophanes in reference to sexual immorality. <laughs> yeah. So you wanted to call somebody a, you know, a whore or something like that, you called them a Corinthian. The ultimate insult. Plato, in his work, The Republic, uses the term Corinthia Cori, uh, translated as Corinthian girl, to describe a prostitute. Even prostitutes were just known as, oh, Corinthian girls. So this, this was an extremely bad place to live in terms of morals. It was destroyed in 146 by the Romans for its role in a revolt against Rome. Evidently, it joined other Greek city-states against Rome. Bad idea. They didn't have what it took to beat them. So it was destroyed. It was rebuilt in 44 BC by Julius Caesar. And by the mid-first century, it had a very large population. Estimates put it anywhere between 100,000 and 600,000 people. It was a huge city. Uh, more living in the city than in the countryside by far. By Paul's day, uh, the Corinth, uh, Corinth had temples dedicated to gods of Aphrodite, Athena, Apollo, Zeus, Poseidon, Fortune, uh, Asclepius, uh, Demeter, Dore, Dionysus, Isis, Serapis, and Caesar. Remember, Caesar was worshipped as a god in the Roman Empire. In fact, the... Uh, the denarius, the Roman denarius, one of the most common coins in the Roman Empire, was stamped with the picture of Caesar on one side. Uh, you remember Jesus at one point asks for a denarius. They say, is it lawful to pay taxes? Jesus says, give me a denarius. And he holds it up and he says, whose picture is on here? And they all say Caesar's. What's not said in that little story is even more interesting and, that, and the denarius, even when it had the, the head of Caesar on that side, it also said in Greek, uh, uh, or is it Latin? In Latin, it said divifilius, which means son of God. Caesar's head with the inscription son of God. Jesus, who's the true son of God, asked for a Roman denarius with the inscription of Caesar, which says son of God on it. And he holds it up. Whose picture? Caesar's. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. That is, this son of God gets the money. That's what he's worth. Render to God the things that are God. He's, he's very subtly saying he's God and Caesar's not. Even though Caesar claims to be God and Jesus claims to be son of man. So the, the worship of Caesar was mandatory in the Roman Empire. One of the tests they would use for converting a Christian back to paganism. They would haul them before the courts. They would arrest them, threaten them with death, and give them a choice. They put up a, a, an idol of Caesar. And the choice was, worship that idol and prove to me you've abandoned Jesus or die. And there are records of Roman governors doing that test with Christians, and the Christians chose death over worshiping Caesar. So you've got a couple of things going on in Corinth then. You've got the huge issue of immorality, which goes all the way back to its founding 800 years before, before Paul, almost 900 years before Paul. Immorality, you've got huge wealth issues because this was a rich city and money was everywhere. So you've got sex, you've got money, and you've got uh, religious pluralism. 
they're worshiping all kinds of different gods. A lot of those gods that we listed off there were Greek, so it goes back to their ancient Greek culture. Some of them are Roman. Some of them are actually even Egyptian. Isis is an example. So this was, it was a pantheism. Any god you wanted was valid to worship in Corinth, and there was probably a temple devoted to it. So, oh, it sounds a lot like America. Sex, money, and worship whatever you want to worship. It's all okay. Except, of course, for Christianity. So, this is why I think Corinth is such a particularly good thing to study for us, because what was going on there is very much like the world we live in. Uh, any comments before we move to the next section? Paul in Corinth. Paul's initial meeting in Corinth is actually recorded for us in Acts 18, if you want to take a look there. It wasn't all smooth. In fact, it turned pretty bad pretty quickly. Acts chapter 18, starting in verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. I'll stop there. Claudius. Um, Rome's history with the Caesars at this point was horrible. This, this was like the worst time in all of Rome's history for the Caesars. You had Caligula, Claudius, and Nero in a row. Claudius is the only one of the first 12 Caesars from Julius Caesar who wasn't a homosexual. Of course, they didn't, they didn't think in terms of orientation. They just you know, had sex with whatever moved. Claudius is the only one who publicly said he wasn't really fond of, of having intercourse with other men. Uh, but all the rest of the Caesars did. So... On that side, he's good, but he was also a, a huge womanizer. Uh, he hated the Jews because of the Jews' morality, more than anything, because Claudius was a very immoral person. But you've got Caligula before him, who, who is a Caesar. If, if you would take the worst mass murderer in American history, a, a complete psychopath, and give him absolute power, you'd have Caligula. He, he was, he was a, a sick human being. Uh, he enjoyed watching people die in front of him. Uh, he, would, he would have the gut piles of his enemy piled up in front of him. Uh, he would bring in special assassins during dinner party to do beheadings for his dinner guests. He was, he was a monster's monster. So you've got Caligula... And you've got Claudius, and then Nero, who's no better than, than Caligula. Nero winds up killing Paul, James, and Peter. So Claudius expels the Jews. He kicks them out of, out of Rome, of all places, which was just as bad as Corinth in terms of morality and religious pluralism. He would tolerate any religion in Rome except for the Jews, because they claimed they had only one God and their morality was different. So verse 3. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was constrained by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. By the way, when it says many of the Corinthians... Uh, the best guesses are that the size of the Christian congregation there during Paul's day was anywhere between 50 and 100. Uh, Corinth was a city of multiple hundreds of thousands, 
and they had less than 100 Christians. Um, scriptures being very generous when it says many of the Corinthians. Hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O oh Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while, then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. So that's Paul in Corinth. That was his experience there. Um, uh, there's a few interesting things happening here. Uh, one, the names of the people that it's mentioning. His first converts in Corinth were Aquila and his wife Priscilla. Those are, are Greek names. It says they were Jews. So at some point, these, these Greeks who were pagans by nature converted to Judaism. Then they, when Paul comes along, convert to Christianity. So these are, are people who have been moved twice by the Holy Spirit, but they probably started off as pagans at one point of time because of the Greek names. Um, another point uh, the Jews reject him. Uh, let's see, verse 6. And he goes to the Gentiles, and he starts worshiping, verse 7, in the house next door to the synagogue. Now, imagine a breakaway group from this congregation moving next door I suppose that is next door. Starting their own little congregation there as a breakaway group. I don't think that's how the Methodist Church started here, but if it had, it'd be one of those things that would create a lasting bitterness. Uh, we've got a little bit of that you know, in town here with past people who've moved away to different churches, but nothing quite this severe. And then worst of all, it says that that Crispus, verse 8, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. So it's like the pastor of the church went with them to this little house church next door to the synagogue. That really would have created some bitterness. And if that's not bad enough, this Sosthenes guy, verse 17, the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. He also seems to have converted. So that's two rulers of the synagogue, two of their rabbis, who go with Paul next door to the synagogue to start a church. Uh, it's no wonder why the Jews get so angry and drag him in front of the city council and try and get him arrested. They are, they are bitter, bitter about this. So, you know, Besides the cultural pressures of an immoral, godless world around them that the Christians have to deal with, they also have to deal with these internal conflicts and attacks with a, with a synagogue next door that hates their guts, even though they're probably related to a lot of them and grew up there. Uh, Jews reject Paul. He turns to the native Greeks. Uh, Again, that's hard feelings. The Jews were the chosen people, the Greeks were the outcasts, and now Paul's going to them. Uh, there's the physical attack, as we said. Um, and now verse 7, or, or I mean, not verse 7, point 7 on the second page of the handout. Considering the religious pluralism of Corinth, you know, all the different gods we listed, and yet the accusation is made against Paul, verse 13, 
He persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. What law could there possibly be in a city of religious pluralism that said you couldn't worship the Christian God? Well, about the only thing I can think is it comes down to that Caesar worship thing again. Romans were free to worship any god they wanted, provided Caesar was also one of those gods. Christians came along and said there's only one true god, and it isn't Caesar. And that actually made them illegal, an illegal religion. Uh, Caesar wasn't just the leader of the, uh, of the nation. It's kind of like in, in England where the king or the queen is considered the defender of the faith. They have this sort of Holy Roman Empire mindset that they're also head of the church. Caesar was president of the College of the Churches. So like there were representatives of all of the different religions that met, and Caesar was the chair of that. He was the head religious person and a god in their eyes. The Christians didn't recognize Caesar in either of those roles, and that did kind of make them enemies of Rome as far as the Romans were concerned. So they try and claim it's an illegal religion, uh, Gallio doesn't want to hear about it, so he kicks them all out. So a couple of notes now in the handout. One, Christianity is a radical religion. It was outside the bounds of social acceptance. It was seen as an offense against prevailing culture. Uh, this is why I think Corinthians is such a good book for us in our day and age, because that is exactly how Christianity is perceived now. We're radical we're outside the bounds of what's socially acceptable uh, to the point of even being prosecuted if we don't go along. Um, you know, you, you look at these uh, court cases, the, 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 the fines being levied against Christians that refuse to do business uh, with couples that are using the business to promote homosexuality or whatever. That's, that's Rome. We're there. That's Corinth. That's, uh, it's no different. It's exactly what was happening to Paul. Uh, consider what Paul would have asked of them. Rejection of all pagan gods and the ritual of worship to those gods. Rejection of all cultural morality and the adoption of a strict chastity. And imagine the effect this would have had in families. The Jewish families that Paul started with, of course, they would have been on the same page with him morally. But the Greeks that he turned to wouldn't have been. Most of those Greeks were raised in families where sexual immorality was okay. I would, I would go so far as to say that probably a great many, if not a majority, of the men who were converts from paganism probably had, at one time or another, had homosexual liaisons. Because it was such an ingrained part of that culture that it was completely socially acceptable. So Paul is... is Dividing families with this, too. Any comments before we look at Corinthians itself? All right, let's start with Corinthians chapter 1. This is a hard place to be a Christian. And the Corinthians, as we'll see as we, as we get into this, they don't have an easy time with this. I think we have kind of a romantic view of the New Testament as being this golden age of faith. If only we could live back then, we would have had things you know, much clearer and such. There is no golden age of faith. 
uh, when you look at, at what the Corinthians had to go through with this, this, this was pulling teeth. This was a painful exercise for them to understand what being a Christian really meant in the world they were living in. It didn't come easy by any means. So verses 1 to 3. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thought to be written in 55 A.D., two years into the reign of Nero, uh, Paul greets these people uh, as Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, notice, notice how he builds them up. It's all very positive. Uh, the church of God in Corinth, verse 2, those who are sanctified, those who are made holy in Jesus, uh, called to be saints, uh, who in every place call on the name of Jesus. They're, they're faithful saints. They're holy people. Oh, it's, it's high praise Paul heaps on them. Which becomes all the more important when we read on and see what horrible things they were, they were up to in Corinth. Paul's starting off with positive reinforcement. He's reminding them who they are so then he can go on and talk about how their lives should be looking. Because that was the disjoint. They were these saints and their lives were immoral. It didn't mesh. Uh, Sosthenes, he mentions in verse 1, this is the same guy who was arrested and beat in front of Gallio that we read in Acts. Uh, it was a ruler of the synagogue. So evidently it would suggest that this Sosthenes guy left with Paul. Uh, after his beating, Paul stayed around for a little while, then goes to Ephesus. Sosthenes comes with him. So he's not in, in Corinth anymore. And he probably helps Paul write. Uh, Paul's, Paul's normal way of writing was somebody else wrote for him. And it's called an amanuensis, a secretary, basically. Um, Paul didn't write himself because he was legally blind. He couldn't see what he was doing. Uh, he does make a comment in one of his letters about having to write with such big letters. So when he had an official letter like this to write, he left it to somebody else you could see. So Sosthenes is basically dictating, taking dictation from Paul. Um, all right, verses 4 to 9. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Jesus Christ. Again, more positive reinforcement. That you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, is, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's just positive reinforcement on more positive reinforcement. Um, these are people who have Jesus, who know Jesus, who are enriched in everything. Now, the first issue, verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So the first issue, he gets right to it. They're divided. There's factions in the church. And, and with a group of just 100 people, you know, a faction is a pretty significant thing. This is a little group to start with. You can't afford to lose half the congregation who runs off to form yet another congregation. They have to work this out. And it wasn't just two factions, it was a lot of factions by the sound of it. Verse 12, now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? They all had their favorite preacher. 
and they all lined up behind him. I like this one, I like that one, this one's better than that one. Uh, you know, some of that human personalities and such are understandable, but they took it to an extreme of where they were actually getting nasty with each other over it. Uh, Paul's, Paul's uh, advice, Paul's command, verse 10, is pleading. Uh, you all speak the same thing and there be no divisions among you, but you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. It sounds almost unreasonable to ask a group of 100 people anywhere, be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. Uh, but this is a common theme, actually, in Paul. Paul brings that same message to everywhere he went. There shouldn't be divisions. As Christians, we should be united. One faith, one doctrine. No agreeing to disagree. That is not the Christian way. Um, in, in our day and age... In fact, this is my, one of my big complaints against synod and synodical officials, which thank, uh, thankfully is a little better under Harrison. But there's always this desire for peace and always this message you get from synodical headquarters. Be at peace, brothers. Just get along. You know, there shouldn't be these divisions. No, there shouldn't be. Um, but their road to peace was don't make a big deal out of the doctrinal divisions. Yeah, they're there, but let's ignore them. Let's pretend they're not there. And that is not Paul's instruction. Paul says, be of the same mind doctrinally. Our world wants peace at the expense of doctrine. Paul pushes doctrine at the expense of peace. The, the road to peace is through all thinking and saying the same things biblically of Christ. Romans, let's look at some other references Paul makes to this and see a consistent message here. Uh, Romans 12, 16 Romans 12, 16, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So be of the same mind, which obviously there includes loving one another. Uh, Romans 15, 5 and 6, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, compare this with the mentality in churches today that want to make both factions happy by continuing to do two different things, including even worship things. You've got your contemporary crowd that meets at this time. You've got your traditional crowd that meets at that time. Everybody's happy. They both get what they want. This isn't Paul's teaching. He says, be of one mind and one mouth glorify God. Not, not each in your own divided way. Romans 16, 17. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. See, avoid doctrinal division. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, 26 to 28. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, everyone is equal. Same mind, same judgment. Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Unity. And finally, Philippians 3.16. 
Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. So a persistent and consistent message, unity in doctrine, which becomes all the more important in a culture of suffering. Uh, it is a huge scandal, a disgrace for Christianity, when at times of persecution, people cower and back down and, and start denying elements of the faith to fit in. Because then it makes God's word look like it's unsure, when it's really the human heart that's unsure. The witness, especially in a, in a, in a, a context like Corinth, with a religious diversity, moral diversity, the best witness of Christ in that setting is a completely unified voice. We are all in this together. We all believe the same things. We all take the same stand. One heart, one mind, one faith. So that's what Paul emphasizes. It's a good lesson for us today. So on the handout, note the importance Paul places on unity and, and oneness. He spoke of a oneness of doctrine and faith. There is no recognition of the benefits of diversity when it came to matters of faith. Yeah, there's no let's agree to disagree in Paul. It's, this is truth, abide by it. All right, uh, and now the, the nature of the division. Again, we've read part of this. Let's start in verse... 13, 1 Corinthians, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, uh, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides this, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Uh, so, the baptism thing was evidently a mark in Corinth of you know, being joined to this or that person who did the baptism. So they were misunderstanding the nature of baptism. Baptism was about being joined to Christ. They saw it as being, well, I was baptized by him, therefore my baptism is better than your baptism. So even basic things like baptism, they weren't understanding properly. They were turning it into a some kind of badge of honor if you were baptized by this or that guy. Uh, all right, it, it, any, uh, any thoughts, any questions? That's kind of the gist of this morning's start to Corinth. All right, if you want to, in preparation, just read through Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, uh, you will be surprised by all of the horrible things they had to deal with. I mean, he's going to go from just divisions over pastors to things like incest. They had incest problems in this congregation. You know, one problem, thankfully, we haven't had here, uh, but they had to deal with it there. No. They, they, they were messianic. They were waiting for a Messiah. They just didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. But, but that was one of the things Paul played on. Um, his normal method of operation when he started congregations was to go into a town and look for the Jews. And he started always with the Jews. And he would go to the synagogues and he would teach openly to the whole synagogue. And, and, and I think probably his tactic was... To, 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 to preach Old Testament messianic theology. And then eventually, once he, once he unfolded to them, this is what the Messiah is going to do, then eventually he started connecting that to Jesus and showing them he was the Messiah. So the Jews were the best targets for Jesus because they, had, they, they were in expectation of the Messiah, they just didn't see it as Jesus. Any other thoughts? Yeah. You know, what's sad is that historical critics and pastors, I think, started in Europe in about the 18th century. And, you know, from that point on, it's gone around. I can remember when our church here and also Kim, it's pretty much together. Mm hmm. 
Mm-hmm. No. No, uh, it, it's not. It, unity, unity is an underappreciated gift to the church. Uh, our culture thrives on diversity, which is not a biblical concept. Now, racially, you know, yeah, Paul went to the Jews and the Greeks. There was no, there was no race in Paul's mind when it came to the gospel. But when it came to, to doctrine, it was everybody is subject to the same. There's no division. Um, yeah, I was just listening to, to my son in Madison complaining about this thing, rightfully so, about how you go to different churches in different cities wanting to find a Lutheran one, and it says LCMS on the sign out front, and you sit there, and whatever they're doing, it ain't Lutheran. You know, they... they not, and not just the praise band stuff, but the, the preaching is so scattered all over the place, not focused on a biblical text, not law and gospel, just goofy practices, um, trying to be cute with people with, with applause. Zach sat through one church in Madison with, uh, he said the congregation would break out in applause every so often. They had a woman get up and do the children's message. They had, uh, they had lay readers. They had all these things. You know, why? Well, because the culture there wanted it. But, but how detrimental that is to the overall church. Now, if you had a pizza hut, if the chain pizza hut, let's say, made its pizzas different between each and every store, it would be a disaster. You'd, you'd never know if you were going to get the pizza from Iowa Falls if you went to Ames. It's, it's, it's a comforting thing to know if I want that kind of pizza, I go there and I get it because they're going to make it the same all over the place. That, that, that unity of practice is a, is a positive, reassuring thing. But when you fragment that unity, it's disaster. And for some reason or another, the Lutheran Church has not quite figured that one out yet. All right, let's close then with prayer. Merciful Lord, we do thank you for the gifts of peace and doctrine that you have given to us as your church and pray that you might continue to foster unity among us through your word and keep us strong in these evil days for Jesus' sake. Amen.